Good evening to everyone, and um, I'm deeply honored to be able to deliver these lectures uh, here. Uh, so much so that I feel the weight of uh, great, my great predecessors as Cadbury lecturers. I normally like to actually look at people when I speak to them. That's what my mother taught me when I was two. Um, and, but this time I'll actually have to read the lectures because I'm afraid that I might not be able to rise to the occasion and to the weight that is expected uh, here. So, um, first lecture is modern homelessness. The last sentence of Ernst Bloch's great book, The Principle of Hope, ends with the following words. There arises in the world something which shines in the childhood of all and in which no one has yet been, home or homeland. It may seem strange to refer to home or to homeland as a place in which no one has yet been. Most humans spend almost every night and good portion of every day at home. They either have a home or if they're homeless, as many are today, they have had a home, a tent, a room, a shack, a house place in their hometown, which is itself nested in their homeland. Everyone has lived in a home. Everyone has certainly been in one. But home doesn't just refer to a con concrete site of our living and belonging. Home is also a powerful image of wholeness and fulfillment. That's what Bloch had in mind when he wrote that home shines to us in a happy childhood. Home is the light of embodied memory of primal unity with the world in the, in the maternal womb, perhaps also of a time in father's arm, or even memory of those occasions when, full of seemingly otherworldly delight, we kept giving a big hug to a rough tree, as my one and a half year da daughter is prone to do right now. <laughs> We also have an inkling of such wholeness when the image of child's delight flashes like some transcendent light over the darkness of its parents' sleeplessness, worry, and a sense of entrapment. Echoing those early childhood experiences, home can pull together all the lines of human longing with respect to a place, to people, into a single object of home and hope for what is not yet. At home, we are fully at one with ourselves while being together with those who are other than, than us, to borrow a phrase from Hegel's philosophy of right, or in the words of Dante, near the beginning of Paradiso, we are at home when we have what we have longed for and when we long for what we have. Quiet, contented joy is perhaps the most characteristic sign of being at home. We've all experienced it, at least fleetingly, but have we ever dwelt in it? As an image of world's wholeness, home is a matter of hope, a place in which we cannot have been because it isn't anywhere yet. Human beings everywhere, writes Bloch, are still living in prehistory. Indeed, all and every still stands before the creation of the world of a right world. True Genesis, that is still Bloch, True Genesis is not at the beginning, but at the end. The idea that the true home is at the end picks up an important strand in Jewish and Christian traditions. According to Genesis, Abraham left his father's house and became pilgrim on the way to the land of promise. In the Christian rendering of the story in the book of Hebrews, 
Even while in the promised land, Abraham was living as a foreigner in tents and was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose architect and builder is God. This hoped for city was his true homeland. A few centuries later, Augustine famously imagined the entire life of Christians as a journey to their true home, to their home with the Lord, as the Apostle Paul has written. This world is a land of their unhappy exile. Christians make use of it during their sojourn. The land of their true enjoyment, Augustine believed, is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And like every good home, God is shared in common by all who enjoy God. In Jewish and Christian traditions, the object of home of hope expressed in the image of home in, is inextricably bound with transcendent. It is either God's gift or God's very being, or as we will argue, both God's gift and God. As such, home doesn't come only at the end of history, but in a sense precedes history as well. Bloch writes, after Jewish and Christian eschatological hopes have been secularized in the course of modernity. For him, before there is home, there is a history of home building, a prehistory of humanity, the driving force of which is the working, creating human being who reshapes and overhauls the given facts. A militant optimist, Bloch believed that the true home can arise in the world only once human beings have grasped themselves and established what is theirs without expropriation and alienation in real democracy. This would mark the end of prehistory and thus complete the true genesis of the new world as human home. As we will see later, the first two chapters of the biblical book of Genesis narrate the primal story of God creating the world as a home for humans that is as such also a dwelling place of God. The conviction is basic to a dominant strand of modernity that <clears throat> The conviction is basic to a dominant strand of modernity is that no home worthy of human lives lies in the distant past at the beginning of human history, as many ancient people thought. Those among the moderns who believe in the true human home, those were the optimistic breed like Kant, Fichte, Hegel, and Marx. They expected it at the end of history as a result of the labor of centuries. Bloch was one of them. But how well did we do on the way to make out of this world the true home of humanity? The report is not very good, as you would guess from the title of the lecture, Modern Homelessness. But before we look more closely let us try to, this homelessness more closely, let us try to clarify what we mean by home. Now, every two-year-old knows the word and perhaps also its referent, but knowing the word doesn't mean knowing what it means. For Bloch, home refers to homeland, and true to his Marxist convictions, by homeland, he means the entire world. The world is the widest of the nested circles of homes, narrowing down to countries, homeland, to cities, hometown, and finally to households, the home in its paradigmatic and most proper sense. As the image of wholeness and hope, Home draws its power primarily from that narrowest and most intimate circle. Now, the first thing when, that comes to mind when we think of home today is likely an apartment or a house in which we live. 
That's where we cook our food and eat, where we keep our favorite objects displayed, where we rest and sleep, clothe ourselves and prepare ourselves to face the world. But home is not just a material dwelling place. Perhaps primarily, home is the people who live there. Today, mostly nuclear family, parents and children, whether biological or adopted, but often also extended family as well, grandparents, aunts, uncles and cousins. Now, as a social and material space both, homes are bounded. Fences and walls circumscribe a home as a private domain from wider public space. They also separate one home from another. Roofs shield it from elements, and invisible but sturdy boundaries also separate those who are within, who are members, and those who are not. At the same time, the boundaries of homes must be passable. Homes have doors for their members to leave and to return, for the bounty of the earth and its fruit and fruits of others' labor to come in, and for the garbage to come out. <laughs> they have windows for the lights to come in and air to circulate and for people inside to see what's going on outside, whether that is a sun-bathed bluebird resting on a fence or a neighbor's yard and the street beside them. Take down the boundaries and the home merges with the world. Close all of its openings and it turns into a grave. Our description of home. Now, let me, let me interrupt here. I have used a number of times we uh, for uh, uh, when I was speaking in first person. Uh, and, and this is not a royal we, which I want to perpetuate uh, here. In fact, this text has been written in close collaboration with a number of my, uh, my co-workers. And in the end, it's going to be co-authored with one of them. And I want to honor them by the pronouns, uh, first person prono pronouns that I use. And the person that ought to be mentioned here is Ryan McAnally Lintz. I've co-authored other books with him, but he has also contributed to this text. So hence our, okay. Our description, Ryan's and mine. Description of home so far might suggest that home is a patterned cluster of entities, some alive and moving, others inanimate and stationary. But that would not be quite right. True, without such entities, without people and without things, there wouldn't be anything to call home. A shopping cart and a place for a mat under a bridge are not a home, but belongings and insecure territory of a homeless person. At the same time, you can have a bounded material and social space and still live without a home. Think of Napoleon in hell, as C.S. Lewis describes him, imagines him in The Great Divorce, living in a palace he himself has de designed pacing through its opulent, large, and well-lit rooms, and incessantly blaming everyone for the abysmal failure of his grand ventures. He has a splendid house, but not a home. A patterned cluster of entities isn't yet a home. Crucial to home are active relationships among these entities. You can put it simply, home is not a thing. It is a vital process. Home is happening among persons and between persons and things, whether living or inanimate. Now, what are those home constituting relations? First, it's a relation of resonance. Resonance comes about when I'm affected by person, by thing, or a whole network of persons and things in such a way that I respond emotionally and often cognitively in, uh, <clears throat> and let myself be tra transformed in an encounter that is not fully under my control. Simply put, resonance happens when persons and things speak to me. 
At home, everything has a potential to speak. I get a whiff of a smell from the kitchen, or I hear steps approaching, and they tell me a story that makes me smile or that makes me frown. I see a scratch on the table or feel a rug under my bare feet and memory is triggered and I feel at home. Second, home involves also strong attachments. I have a bond to the people and the place that make up my home, like a child does with its toy piggy. If they were, they were to disappear from my life, I would feel diminished, often devastated, even at times bereft of the meaning in life. Because of the fear of loss, and perhaps for other reasons as well, I tend to actively care for people and things that make up home. That's a function of attachment, in part. Finally, <clears throat> home requires mutuality. If resonance and attachment are one-sided, they may be cohabitation, but they will be no home. I cannot properly feel at home with you if you don't feel at home with me. Similarly, if there is no shared vision about what belongs in the home and what should stay out, as well as about how boundaries are to be maintained, there will be no home. Now, home, I believe, is the most basic unit of human life, material and social space in which basic human needs for love and belonging, for agency and cooperation, for food and shelter can be satisfied. It is also the most suitable environment for the reproduction of human life, a space into which an infant can be welcome, welcomed and developed into a mature human being. Unsurprisingly then, home is the most likely candidate for a site of flourishing human life. We, Ryan and I, <laughs> have argued elsewhere, and in fact we have done that in a book that we've published together, we have argued elsewhere that the flourishing life has three distinct, though closely interrelated, dimensions. Life being led well, which is right agency, including proclivity to act in right ways. Second, life going well, which is right set of social and material circumstances. And life feeling good, which is a right set of emotions. In the New Testament, the three dimensions of flourishing are summed with the, word, sum up to, with the words righteousness or love, peace and joy in Romans 4, 7, 14, 17. Righteousness is the right kind of agency, life being led well. Peace is the right circumstances, life going well. Joy is the right emotion, life feeling as it ought to. Though distinct, each also requires others to be fully itself, and that's why each can sum up from one angle, the entirety of the flourishing life. At their best, homes are places where love, peace, and joy come together. In such homes, each rejoices over and each rejoices with all others, and all rejoice in their common social and material space. Each loves others and is loved by them, and all tend their common space. Each individually and all together are at peace, enjoying and working to enhance the material and social circumstances that are their home. Now to say, as we have, that homes are at their best, <coughs> at their best implies that for the most part, our homes are not in that ideal state. Most homes fall short and they fall short in myriads of ways, small and large. Some are even sites of life-destroying terrors. The possibilities and perils of home 
I think, are related, precisely because homes have the power to contribute to so much flourishing in human life, they can be places where deepest wounds, most resistant to healing, are inflicted. Still, many of us have had experiences of genuine at-homeness, short-lived but nonetheless real as they have likely been, and those experiences weren't limited to childhood as Bloch suggested. That's why home can serve as an image of human wholeness in a world made whole. As circumscribed places, at circumscribed places and for brief moments, in the best of homes, we can have a foretaste of the world to come, a Christian would say. Now Bloch had a similar hope, and it was an echo of Karl Marx's vision of the communist society. As genuine solution, this is Marx now, early Marx, as genuine solution of the antagonism between humans and nature and among humans themselves. The prehistory of humanity, its dialectical march through time, would result in the creation of the world, of the right world, whose true name is home or homeland. Recall that from Bloch's statement earlier. A vision of home, you could say, is one of the highest hopes of modernity. One of the biggest tensions of modernity is that the means it has generated to create that hope turn out to systematically undermine its achievement. And that's what I turn now to, um, reflection on homelessness. Now, at the heart of the shift from Latin Christendom to modernity is what some have called revalorization of what some have called ordinary life. Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, tells the story of a visit that Jesus paid to the home of his friends, two sisters, by the name of Mary and Martha. Martha was in charge of the household affairs. She was busy making sure that the guest was well cared for. You all know the story. While Martha was working, Mary was was sitting with her friend, the great teacher, drinking at the fountain of spiritual wisdom. Understandably, Martha was irritated about the unfair arrangement, and she complained to Jesus, tell her to help me. And Jesus responds, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need for only one thing, Mary, has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. Now, over the course of centuries, Mary became for Christians the figure of contemplation of eternal heavenly things, those related to our heavenly home. And Martha became a figure of care for transitory things related to the building and flourishing of earthly homes, so-called contrast between vita contemplativa and vita activa. In the transition from medieval Christendom to modernity, Mary gradually lost stature and Martha came fully into her own. In the middle of the transition is the Protestant reformer Martin Luther. As he saw it, Martha's work, when properly done, is in no way inferior to Mary's but an alternative way of pursuing the need for only one thing. Given that Mary was always hard model to follow, the next step was easy to make. It was to come to live as if the only home that truly matters is the home of this world. Now, whether we are religious or not, most of us, most of our contemporaries, believe that we belong to this world and that our home is in this world, at least for a while. Modernity is Martha, homemaker, triumphing over Mary, the contemplative. It is the paradox of modernity, though, 
that we are often homeless in the place that we call home or in the only place that we can call our home. Now, let's distinguish between having a home and feeling at home and consider modern homelessness with respect to each. When it comes to having a home, technological advances and economic expansion have made it possible not just to build enough home to ho homes to house everyone, but to craft homes the likes of which kings and queens of the past had not seen and could not even dream up. Modern campers can be more luxuri luxurious than most ancient castles. Almost two centuries ago, August Comte, a sociologist, could envision a near future society in which every family would own an apartment with no fewer than seven rooms. Yet today, millions around the world find themselves without a home. They either live on the margins of economic life and are temporarily or permanently unhoused, or in much greater numbers, they have been pushed and pulled out of their homes and hometowns to live as refugees and exiles. That too is a consequence of modernity, above all of the system of creation and distribution of goods that contribute to the widespread lack of feeling at home. The last two centuries have seen an unprecedented number of migrants. 2017, an estimated 244 million people are international migrants. Around the world, the population of forcibly displaced persons, refugees, internally displaced people and asylum seekers has reached 68.5 million. Each day, on an average, 44,000 people are forced to flee home. These numbers represent a massive increase from 50 years ago only. Domestic migration from rural areas to cities, especially the ballooning megacities of China, India, and the Global South, has meant the departure of millions from familial, social, cultural, and then geographical settings and their settlement in rapidly changing new environments. It also left many millions squatting on the land they did not own in makeshift houses in massive sprawling slums that no, not, not long ago were a countryside. Meanwhile, urban homelessness in places like United States and Australia rose dramatically beginning with 1980s and remained substantially higher than in post-war decades. On a given night, in 2018, over 550,000 Americans would be without a home. The major causes of homelessness are well known, and most of them are connected to some central aspects of modernity. First is political instability. Wars, especially the civil wars so characteristic of the last century, displaced millions often with little hope of return as conflicts drag on for years, even decades. Even after they have died down, returning refugees offer face, often face destroyed homes and infrastructure, barely functioning economic and educational systems, and the prospect of persecution at the hands of victors. The second cause is poverty. Global economic growth notwithstanding, Drastic inequality combined with rapid transformation of social relations and economic structures has meant destitution for millions, dispossessing many of their houses and lands and impelling them to pull up roots in search of sustenance. Finally, there is environmental degradation. Modern developments have wreaked environmental havoc making farmers and pastoralists unable to sustain their ways of life. Many are left with little choice but to leave their lands and move to the cities. Almost always, all three of these factors, war, poverty, and environmental degradation, operate together. Loss of home exacts heavy toll 
both psychologically and physically. Homelessness reduces one's overall health, and rates of PTSD and depression are higher among refugees than broader population. Not having a home threatens to destroy one's identity and sense of belonging. Now, it is true that many of the displaced and homeless have overcome the wound of homelessness and turned suffering into source of flourishing. I have to mention um, uh, some of my uh, folks who, 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 who work in our household and in my yard. Their child has just been admitted to Yale University. <laughs> which is absolutely stunning. Uh, he was valedictorian in his, in his high school. Uh, here they are, um, gardeners, uh, and um, he's gotten into best, one of the best colleges uh, in the world. It's uh, very, very impressive. And many refugees, actually, and uh, exiles do just that, which is absolutely stunning. On the whole, though, the widespread experience of losing and not being able to find a place to call home is a moral scandal in modern societies, which see themselves in the image of home-making Marta. That so many people don't have a home is a moral scandal. Physical homelessness has existed, of course, for millennia. Modernity has not introduced it into the world. But modernity has made physical homelessness more widespread, and given that it has, it has means to solve it, it has turned it into a moral scandal. Now, shadowing the scandal, however, is a cultural paradox. Even many of those who have a place to call home are actually unable to feel at home. Widespread absence of a sense of home in the place that we dwell and believe that is our home is the new and specifically modern type of homelessness. Again, examples of something like that can be found elsewhere, but it has its significant modern inflection. And that's what I want to um, concentrate on right now. Mm. Move this page too quickly. <laughs> So let me sum up what the claim that I've made. The world is our only home, and yet we don't feel at home in it. That's one of the major paradoxes of modernity. It is clear why medieval Christians, for instance, would not feel at home in the world. They were not supposed to feel at home in the world, for they saw themselves as exiles in the world, away from their true home. But why would we moderns feel homeless in the only place that can possibly be our home? Any answer to this question, I think, has to begin with recognizing the legacy of colonialism. The various colonial projects violently dis dislocated native peoples in massive numbers, from villages to plantations or mining towns, from nomadic rhythms to stultifying reservations, from Africa to Americas via Middle Passage. Physical displa displacement on such scale is bound to rise for millions the question of what it would mean to feel at home in places their forebears did not choose, and even to question whether new homelands should be theirs in any strong sense. But colonialism also influenced the development of the key features of modernity that eat away at the ability of all to feel at home in the world. They leave us ambivalent about the key dimensions of home, about resonance with things that I mentioned is key element of home, about abiding attachments, about stable boundaries. Either res neither resonance nor abiding attachments, nor the stable, relatively stable boundaries are, so to speak, at home in the modern, modern world. Why? First is individual autonomy. As moderns, we imagine ourselves as sovereign individuals, owners of ourselves and our actions. And by the way, we do so notwithstanding of us that none of us notwithstanding the fact that none of us is a sovereign individual and that most of us experience some form of domination. To feel at home 
We must affirm each other as members of home. We must have shared vision of home and maintain boundaries in common. In the phrase to feel at home, we must feel at home together. But the self and the rest of the home can grow apart and become hostile to one another. To maintain a home, it is necessary for the members to adjust their expectations and behavior and identities to one another. The commitment to such adjustment is difficult to sustain for those who perceive themselves as sovereign and therefore autonomous. When the strain in relationships becomes too strong enough, a person may decide to leave home or be ejected from the home by others. Alternatively, she may decide to stay, but estrangement continues. Either way, the home is undone, at least for that person. As the biblical stories of Cain and Abel and of Joseph and his brothers indicate, undoing of home because of the inability of persons to share a home is not a modern phenomenon. What is modern is the ease with which homes are undone. Second, reification or objectification. Modern science is a major way in which we cognitively relate to the world. In the sciences, all entities appear as things, as part of the web of causal relations. As Bruno Latour has recently noted, the sciences grasp all things from far away, as if they were external to the social world and completely indifferent to human concerns. Modern technology tends to do the same. To a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail, say, the saying goes. To a person with a tool, all things become manipulable objects. Modern medicine is a case in point. It treats human bodies as things to be brought into wholeness. Analogous forms of reification are feature of other domains of modern life. Modern economies, in modern economies, the market relentlessly expansive in character has a tendency to turn everything into commodities, good to be bought, goods to be bought and to be sold. For the market, even human persons are not sacred, but can become objects in the calculus of value. Modern politics, as Michel Foucault observed in his late work, the state becomes, uh, comes to treat the population as its own vital resource. The health, the capacities, even happiness of individuals become concerns for government for the sake of the state's own security and development. Many argue plausibly in our view that the reification of the world, objectification of the world, uh, contributes significantly to the current destruction of the environment. Now, my point is not that the science, technology, markets, modern politics are uniformly bad and that we ought to simply dispense with them. It is rather to indicate that these powerful ways of relating cognitively and practically with the world reduce world to a causally linked nexus of manipulable things. Relating to the world with their help, we stand before a mute universe with which it is difficult to establish a relation of resonance. But resonance with things and persons is a constitutive feature of home. Reification tend to rob us, tends to rob us of ability to feel at home in the world, including to feel at home in our own homes. The reaction of the earth to human aggression that's tied to objectification Earth's rage in the form of extreme weather phenomena, for instance, diminishes further the human ability to feel at home in the world. So first was autonomy, second was reification, third is struggle. For centuries now, modern people have thought and experienced the world as a theater of struggle. Mostly we know that the world is always more than that, a place of cooperation, friendship, of trust, of love and joy, more and more such virtues and practices. 
but struggle still dominates as a quick sampling of major ways of thinking and engaging the world illustrates. Evolutionary biology in the 19th century comes to conceive of the processes of life uh, as a struggle for existence. Even if cooperation has been acknowledged since Darwin in a power, as a powerful force in evolution, competition between species and members of species and more recently between genes themselves is seen as pervasive. The word is, world is a harsh, capricious, threatening environment filled with predators and rivals with no special place for any particular creature and individual. A similar agonistic imagination is highly influential in modern, psycho uh, in modern psychology. Consider a psychoanalytic account of the crisis of birth. Our very entry into the world, I quote, propels us into a state of anxious vulnerability, of worried searching and scheming, an endless self-protective struggle to grasp and hold an other whose unity with us is ruptured at birth and restored only at life's end. In politics, too, the struggle comes to occupy a central place in modern cultural imagination. You can think of Thomas Hobbes there and other forms of uh, expressions of that struggle. We can also observe the increased competitiveness in economic life. Long gone is the world of Adam Smith, to whom competition appears as rather benign and mutually beneficial. Today's finance-dominated capitalism makes direct, high-stakes win-or-lose competition between individuals and essential to economic survival. Now, this is about kind of the systems, but consider now individuals within those systems. When individuals under pressure to achieve themselves live in competitive environments, the result is the characteristically modern struggle for recognition. The social world is a space in which we can only meet, in which we not only meet our physical needs or fail to do so, but also in which we search for our identity. Our identity is at stake. We depend on others for recognition. But in the modern world, that recognition comes about in highly competitive context. What is more, expressing one's individual identity in a way that demonstrates economic value has become an important way of getting ahead in the labor market. So recognition success and economic success are tangled up in one another today in relentlessly competitive economic and cultural context. Taking all these developments together, it is easy to see how they contribute to modern sense of homelessness. Imagine imagining and organizing the world as a nested series of scenes of struggle is hardly conducive to resonance and attachment that are so crucial for the sense of home. Final, um, fourth, Logic of escalation. His writings, Hartmut Rosa, has argued that the defining feature of modern society, both modern individuals and modern institution, is that they can stabilize or it can stabilize itself only dynamically, or more precisely, that it can only reproduce its structure through an increase of some sort. Basic idea being that you are in modern society, you live in modern society the way you ride your bicycle. You either pedal and pedal faster and faster or you fall off. <laughs> and that's true of large institutions as well as of individual lives. So never having enough, never feeling good enough, understood not as a moral stance but as a condition of survival, undermines our ability to feel at home. 
So does a sense that we cannot control the world, that we cannot slow its pace and steer its movement. No one can feel at home in a runaway world. Now, modern escalation has two basic forms, and they each make the kind of resonance, attachment, but and boundary maintenance needed for a sense of home very difficult. The first is, as we have noted, acceleration of the pace. Here's a quote from Hartmut Rosa uh, concerning uh, our relationship to time. This is perhaps, this is what perhaps characterizes characterizes everyday predicament of the over, overwhelming majority of subject, subjects in Western societies most aptly. Amidst monetary and technological affluent, affluence, they are close to temporal insolvency. We need more time to do our work properly. We need more time to improve our skills and knowledge, to renew our hard and software. We need more time to take care of, for our, of our kids and elderly parents, more time for our friends and relatives, for our house or flat or for our body. And finally, we need more time to come to terms with ourselves, our souls and psyches, more time to come to terms with not having any time. Acceleration of pace of life goes hand in hand with expansion of scope of our engagement, a second form of escalation. A child of a globe-trotting parent might rightly complain that the difference between God and their parents is almost minimal, is minimal, namely that God is everywhere, but that their parents is everywhere except here, <laughs> except at home. Now, we all get the joke except that the joke applies to an average teenager holding a smartphone while sitting in his, his living room. The pull of an expanded reach of both parents and children make a sense of home elusive. Homes need time and presence, but the logic of expansion in its acceleratory, acceleratory and expansive forms but the logic of escalation with its accelerator and expansive forms makes both of these things difficult. Finally, the loss of transcendence. Modernity is not secularity and secularity is not homelessness. Many people continue to believe in God, but they are at cross pressured in their belief and always exposed to the winds of alternative possibilities. Many secularists believe that you can find yourself at home without faith in God. Indeed, many of them believe that faith in God is, uh, uh, absence of faith in God is necessary for you to feel at home. Karl Marx was one of those. I am more compelled by Nietzsche than I am with Marx, by Marx in this regard. Following the trail of the pessimistic philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer, Nietzsche broke with the association between atheism and at-homeness in the world. Though he urged faithfulness to the earth, that faithfulness meant honesty and courage not to project onto the world a cozy idea of home, but to see it and live in it for what it is, as in what it is, a theater of struggles in which lambs might well bear grudges against birds of prey, but where in f there are in fact no good re reasons to blame the large birds of prey for carrying off little lambs. With the death of God, the world as a home has been irretrievably lost. Let me end by kind of backing up uh, or backpedaling a little bit, <laughs> indicating that the world is not um, in as bleak of a state in modernity as uh, I have described it. Though modernity is erosive, 
uh, of our ability to feel uh, at home. There are counter currents in the modernity that um, push against all these home undermining features of modernity, counter trends as well, non-individualistic and encumbered accounts of self, non-reified modes of relating to people, philosophies and ways of life that instead of struggle, strengths friendship and reconciliation, practices that seek to slow the pace of life and narrow the range of engagement, stances that in the face of loss of transcendence seek to reaffirm secular forms of humanism or to rediscover various forms of religiosity. Only some of these attempts to counter home undermining features of modernity are actual attempts to restore at homeness in the world. But there are such as well, and I'll try to uh, address them uh, in, the, in the future. Most in the third lecture, most familiar of those are concentration on the nuclear family as home. The other one is nation or community as home. And the third is religion as home. They both have something right about him, and they're both under the pressures of modernity twist the sense of at-homeness. At least that will be the argument of the turn, uh, third lecture. But now, final comment that I need to, uh, to make is this. They are those of our contemporaries who have given up on home, at least on home in this earth. Most are familiar with religious versions of casting off the ties with the earth. They come in apocalyptic and mystical forms. The apocalyptic's hope for the rupture from this earth before it gets destroyed in a great conflagration and for return to the new earth where righteousness dwells. The mystics hope for the flight of their souls from the earth and the body to the to the disincarnate unity with God, uninterested in material creation. There are also secular versions of earth-discarding attitudes, just such earth-discarding attitudes. More radical forms of transhumanism seem to give up not just on earth, but on any vision of, of home because they imagine human survival in forms of knowledge or data and detached from any war form of carbon-based life. Others are laying groundwork for a secular rupture. Departure from this overpopulated, ecologically de devastated, war-plagued Earth and settlement in peaceful colonies in space with weather all year round, like Maui on its best day. If you've read recently the news, Jeff Bezos is engaged in just such uh, a project. Now, given our apparent impotence before the looming ruin of our terrestrial home, it is tempting to discard and abandon the Earth. But that would be a colossal mistake. In the, instead, we need to see it transformed into our home. For that's what the Earth was originally created for, to be the true home of humanity along with countless other creatures. This is what the ancient texts, both Jewish and Christian, tell us, the beginning of the book of Genesis and the beginning of the Gospel of John. As we will see in the next lecture, central to both of these texts is the conviction that any true home for humanity must also, and above all, be a home of God. Thank you.